talk, we're going to talk about a bit uh, images, of course, deep learning, why not? And we have some of images on our website. And also, we'd like to go beyond images. So actually, I think it really uh, matches well uh, with the previous talk uh, for recommendations, how to use uh, basically networks, deep or shallow or deepish, either call. <laughs> And we're going to talk about and see how we can make use of these nice <laughs> tricks for other recommendation tasks. Um, I'll just say Sorry, man. It's man. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I think Ifo is here, so we can start. <laughs> no, no. Uh, OK. Uh, again, no. <laughs> So, oh, my computer is going to sleep. So a little bit about outline. Oh, I have a screen there. So when to use deep learning? So that's not a very difficult question to answer if you know your task. Uh, and I'll mention a couple of uh, cases where we have seen tremendous uh, uh, valuable contribution from these deep networks. Uh, and also, what do we see in images? Uh, that's also quite important for us. As I said, at Booking.com, we have a lot of images. Uh, when you make a search on, on our uh, website, you go to a hotel page and then you start uh, scrolling through the gallery to see if the hotel the room uh, you like or not. So that gives us a lot of uh, actually playground to see a benefit in images. So what do we actually see in them? Does it make sense for us to use it? Uh, okay, maybe I should turn off my sound. Uh, and then... Uh, how do we use image content? So let's say we know what is existing in the image. How can we use it to help customers? That's also another important area I'm going to talk about. And now following that, the, the second part will be about the recommendations. How can we use deep networks for recommending uh, hotels or any kind of logistic regression or, or a uh, linear regression problem? Can we fit this using some embeddings very similar to the previous talk? Uh, very nice one, actually. And finally, Stas will cover about uh, how we are scaling this, right? Uh, we have a huge demand from our users. We have millions of users every day. And how can we scale this uh, without breaking? That's a huge challenge. So let's start quickly. Uh, deep learning, as I said, has been very, very uh, powerful for many of the tasks. And we see and hear a lot in our job interviews uh, for any small kind of problem, people try to use deep learning. It might work, uh, but maybe there are easier ways to do it. And it also could be faster. So that's why I'm going to uh, just mention very famous uh, use cases that we have seen, again, tremendous improvement. Starting with ImageNet at 2012 with Alex Krzyzewski, we have seen a very nice imp uh, implementation of a convolutional network on the NVIDIA GPUs for the first time, I guess. So it has shown that it's, it, can, it can move the needle at ImageNet competition, I think, from uh, error rates of top five, uh, around 30%, it decreased to like 18 or something, I'm not sure. Uh, so following that, of course, no one used the other uh, older descriptors or any like Sift, Hog, Gaussian mixture models, they were kind of forgotten very quickly. That's OK. We have to move on. And also, very nice, uh, sometimes fun, uh, like applications we have seen, like image styling, uh, style transfer, actually. So for any image, you can transfer it to any specific style of a painter, like Van Gogh. Uh, so that's also a very fun <coughs> application. Of course, recently, uh, generative adversarial networks have been very, very interesting and I think there is still a bit more time we have to understand what they are uh, actually doing and how we can use them um, and also for text in machine translation we have seen very nice uh, results Google has recently uh, changed their uh, translator tool to uh, neural networks uh, and also on speech uh, with uh, DeepMind, WaveNet, Baidu, DeepVoice and recently Takatron from Google are also showing very, very humanly uh, performances. And finally, Deep and Wide, which is a title of a paper announced in Rex's uh, 2016. Uh, so Google is also using such, at least they are saying that they're using it on their Play Store and YouTube recommendations, which gives us a quite mm -hmm. nice intuition that it should make uh, definitely worth a try. So moving on to images in the first part. Okay. 
so what do we see in images? Actually, uh, this is a very easy and also very difficult question. So when I have a look at this image, I can see that there's a chair, there's a TV, bed, balcony, a lamp on the ceiling. Uh, but so for booking.com, what it makes a difference or not is another question, right? When I take this image and put it through a commercial uh, API, uh, I get the following results. Most of them are actually quite correct. So it's oceanfront, nature, beach house, building, penthouse, apartment, with, with the confidence levels you can see, uh, which are, as I said, mostly correct. But does it really make sense for us to use it on our website? That's why we had to come up with a solution of our own, because we have a very unique corpus. We have mostly hotel images, right? We don't see zebra, hopefully, or maybe if it's next to a, a zoo, a hotel, we might also see zebra. Uh, but mostly we won't see a zebra. That's why we have to adapt these networks to for our corpus. That's what we did, actually. And now, if you look at this photo, you would like to see that it's the photo of a room. So that's a good start, and it's interior. That's also nice. Uh, and it's looking over the sea. So we can tell that, okay, if you're looking for a sea view in your hotel, that room could be a nice choice for you. And there is a bed that's nice that you can sleep on. Um, that's the reason that we cannot just take away any existing solution. Uh, we needed to build our own. Fair enough. And we can do it because it's quite straightforward these days. Uh, but again, we, our unique corpus makes us a little bit different now. We cannot just use the image net classifiers because differentiating between cats and dogs will not help us. Uh, and we have to come up with our own labels, right? That's also quite a huge challenge because what's a good label? Why should we try to recognize a bed or but not a chair? But why a balcony or like TV? Should we also try to understand the coffee cups? Uh, so it's, so this this problem internally brought a lot of challenges, so that's why I'm just going to name a couple of them. And also multi-classes, right? Or most of our images are have multiple labels. So it's a, a photo of a room, <clears throat> also it has a bed, it has a view. So we have to be very good in terms of defining our loss function to handle multiple <coughs> classes. And also, can we use the hierarchy in these images? So if you know that it's a bed, then it should be an interior, right? I mean, unless you're really going for a crazy hotel. Um, and accuracy, yeah, evaluating accuracy of a classifier also requires a lot of human attention. And finally, we have to scale it because we are receiving more than 200,000 images per day. These are mostly coming from the new partners joining or from our users, from our visitors. Just like you stay in a hotel in Amsterdam tonight, you like it or you don't like it, whatever the reason is, you upload the image and write a review. I like it because it has a nice view. The sheet was not very clean, so you upload it, and then it helps the next customer when uh, they would like to stay in that hotel, and also gives, gives us a nice way to give a feedback to the hotelier that where can they improve. So again, now we know, let's say, what is there in the images, and how can we use it? How can we use it for personalization? Uh, that's what we are going for. We would like to personalize your experience when you log into your uh, uh, when you come to our website. So if you're looking for a beach resort, we know that you're going to probably want to swim if the weather is nice. And maybe it makes sense to show you more of the, the beach images or the swimming pool. So if you can identify all of these automatically, we can show them uh, in an earlier phase, hopefully. And then you can enjoy it better and then make your decision. Again, if you're looking for a breakfast included hotel, it also makes sense to identify the breakfast photos and then show it to our users. And how do we decide if showing anything is good or not? Of course, we don't make such decisions at Booking.com. We let our users uh, go through the website and get the signal and the feedback from our users. If they enjoy it, they will show this signal to us. And then we make extensive A-B tests on our website to make the proper decision. And also a very nice application. If we know all the, uh, if we can identify all the food photos coming from our users, we can also get the lat long from the images in the EXIF if they are not corrupted. Now we can pinpoint them on a very nice menu on a map. So this is just a very minor, uh, very small scale <coughs> example. I think around maybe 10,000 images you can see here. And we just plot them on the uh, map. Now you can click on them. This is again for uh, fun purposes, for visualization. And we can see where people eat and what they eat. 
And if we know this, we can tell, okay, if you're staying in a hotel now, if you want to eat, maybe there's a nice restaurant here and there are some photos from our users. So knowing this whole information gives opens a new era for us, let's say, and we can personalize your uh, stay. So that's mostly about images. Uh, as you might imagine, we also have a huge challenge in terms of uh, recommending uh, hotels or anything on our website. And uh, that's why we spend some time to understand if there's value of using neural networks in this. No, I'm not done yet, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think this is the course when you make the presentation last morning. So uh, this is, uh, again, about uh, how to train a deep network, uh, basically. Uh, just I just like to mention. So it, you can come up with two ways, right? You can get a lot of image data, you can collect your labels and then train a network from scratch. That's a very uh, well-known way to do it. Another uh, well-known way to do it is actually take a pre-trained network uh, and use the embeddings, let's say, from the uh, final layers and then trying to change them with the new labels. So this is called, this is nothing but a transfer learning where you basically have a huge variety of labels and data here and then you create your model. And using this model, you transfer the embeddings or the weights to a new model. And now with a fever, of course, data, you can now again uh, train a network. So this is a very useful way where you have a wide variety of uh, information on your base model. And you have limited corpus or limited number of examples on your final, uh, final test fire. Let's see, is it the last slide of the images? No, not yet. So evolution of deep architectures, right? So we have seen uh, in literature, okay, uh, I get my signal, I should be a little bit faster. So uh, in, the, in the history, starting from 1997, eight, sorry, the first network on the left is like Lonet from Jan Lekum. Uh, it's been used very uh, widely for OCR and it has shown very nice results. But the corpus was small, uh, and convolutions were implemented on uh, on a CPU, of course. But then it has changed a lot. So with the second network here from Alex Krzyzewski, the one I mentioned for the ImageNet competition that moved the needle, uh, has led up to this whole uh, new uh, networks. So this is only very part of it, right? So this is uh, LeNet, AlexNet, VGG, GoogleNet, Inception, Inception V3, uh, and this is uh, ResNet only 52. So there is another version of 1,000 layers, which will make all of them vanish, I think, in, in scale. So what we did is actually we took multiple of these uh, modern ar architectures and we played around, we trained a lot, and then so the, we picked the one that was giving a nice uh, trade-off between computation time and accuracy. Yes, our images are over. I'm moving very fastly to the next part where I'm going to talk about how to use deep networks about uh, for recommending a hotel or any other uh, action for your users. So we have users coming, our, coming to our website and booking a hotel. So that, this is where we get the signal. And then we would like to use this data information to recommend a uh, hotel for the next user. And how we do it is basically we can define our uh, problem as a supervised learning problem, where our objective is to find the probability of booking a hotel. So we'd like to, if we can find this nicely, then we can uh, recommend hotels to the users uh, in a uh, descending order. And what kind of features we can use? Actually, we have a lot of features, of course, from our users, from the hotels, and we select uh, whatever we like. Uh, like we define our user features, it could be a country, language of the user, and then we can also get the contextual features like the day of week uh, to account for seasonality, and then the item features, of course, the price of the hotel will make a huge difference in your uh, decision, also maybe the location. And again, our final goal is to find the probability of booking given these user uh, contextual and the item features. What you can do is basically train a logistic regression, which has been a powerful tool in industry for many uh, different tasks. If you know how to use it, <coughs> it could be very, uh, very powerful again. And it's very widely available on most of the libraries and frameworks. Uh, and what this paper from Google, the one in below, uh, presents is that if we can take this logistic regression 
and then merge it with a deep network. We can account for the minorization coming from logistic regression and the generalization coming from the deep network. So that's what the paper is uh, claiming. And actually, <laughs> what it does is this white part, they call it, which is logistic regression, has input features, like visitor city, Wi-Fi, is free Wi-Fi or not. And then you also use the cross features, right? like interactions. If the users from Amsterdam prefer uh, free Wi-Fi hotels, and if they do it frequent enough, maybe it's something we should to know. Maybe it should be even a rule, you know? Maybe for all users from Amsterdam, we should always show the free Wi-Fi hotels. This is, of course, just an example. You can come up with a similar example for your domain. Uh, and the cross feature here is actually very, very important because we would like to assign a very uh, strong bias, actually, uh, uh, for these frequent occurrences of the uh, item and user pairs. And what we'd like to do on the deep part is actually uh, take these features again, but this time not use them directly, but have an embedding layer in between, which is initialized randomly and learned throughout the training. And on the back propagation, we will learn these embeddings. So this is not something we define. This is something the network decides depending on the output. So this is again a supervised learning problem. Uh, <coughs> embeddings are fed into the uh, fully uh, <clears throat> fully connected layers with uh, linear activations and, then the, and there is a sigmoid activation in it. So the idea of this deep part is that it will be able to generalize with the help of these embeddings for also unseen items like a new hotel joining uh, without the information uh, of the user behavior on this hotel. We can generalize very easily so it can also account for the cold start problem. Uh, and learning these dance embeddings uh, could also help a lot for other tasks. And how to combine? We have the white part, logistic regression. We have the deep pitch part, as I call, two hidden layers of fully connected with dance embeddings. And then you like to combine them together. And you just combine them, concatenate the feature vectors here. And then add a sigmoid layer or a linear layer, depending on your task. This paper is focusing on the probability of a uh, user uh, installing an app. That's why it's a sigmoid layer there. And now you can just back propagate. So the idea of this network is that it would learn, memorize very frequent items on the white part and try to generalize for the unseen examples in the training set on the deep part via the embeddings. So that's the motivation. But this is nothing different than the bias varying straight off that we all know. So the bias is the algorithm's tendency to consistently learn the wrong thing, this which is also called underfitting. And the variance is the algorithm's tendency to learn random things like outliers. And this is also called overfitting. Like in this example, this is the example of a uh, price, house price versus the size of a house. As you can see, as the size grows higher, the price increases, but it will also saturate at, um, at some point. Right? And if you try to model this with a first order polynomial, like a line, it will probably give a nice distribution but it will probably also give a high bias, right? But it will be good at generalizing, so you won't be that wrong. <coughs> also, on the contrary, if you try to model this distribution uh, with a uh, this uh, fourth order polynomial, it will very nicely overfit and give a very small error on the test set. And this is the case of the high variance. But if you can model it at the correct level in terms of the complexity of the model, you can very nicely fit a polynomial it will uh, be good at test and train. Again, where this variance sound bias came, comes from is actually you have a model that gives an output here. So for given any x, we would like to get the output y. And e is the sensor noise here, which is a, a normal, dis normal distribution with sigma e. Uh, and the, if you define the squared or er error function here, we can rewrite it as the ex expected value of the actual value minus the predicted value in square. Uh, if you rewrite it, which is quite straightforward actually, we can rewrite this form in this formula. Right? And this is actually nothing but the square of the bias plus the variance and the irreducible error here. So the best predictor in this case would try to minimize both variance and the bias, uh, but it will come uh, at the point that you will not be able to minimize. So again, for illustrative purposes, for our understanding, usually, usually, uh, 
if you go in a higher complex model, just like the one in our previous example with the house pricing, if you go fourth order polynomial, you'll be better at decreasing your bias. So you will overfit. So you'll get very nice results in your training set. But then total error will not be very nice. So there is usually a kind of a nice point in between uh, in model complexity on the x-axis. And how we do this balancing between, oh, I think I can't, yeah, it's back. Uh, so how could we uh, have this balance between the vice and the trade-off is with this network. This is what it's claimed uh, by jointly, uh, jointly optimizing for both wide and the deep part. And also this formula here takes into account both the wide part, the logistic regression, phi is the interactions, uh, x is the input, uh, and with the deep part. So this is the major difference, actually, a very nice approach compared to the ensemble methods like uh, random forest, where we train multiple trees uh, independently. And then we assume they're all weak learners, and then we try to get like a, a consensus out of these trees. Uh, and they are very, very uh, strong classifiers. But this is, I, I think it's a very nice idea. It tries to jointly optimize these both parts, accounting for the variance and the bias. And finally, of course, we need a code, PI data. It's quite actually straightforward to uh, use these existing models. Uh, this is a code snippet. Of course, it will take a little bit more lines, but you can uh, define your, uh, Define your sparse columns very easily, and then define your continuous real column. And then this is how we define a cross column interaction. And then again, embedding columns, which you will embed and which for which you will learn the weights throughout the back propagation. And then you try to fit your DNN model, uh, which in this case, uh, hidden in so 1,000, 500, and 2,000, 200, and you just press on fit, and it will probably take some time, depending on your data set. Uh, and now we have to scale this, and that's where Stas is going to talk about. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to guide you through uh, uh, process how we train and deploy models in booking, deep models in booking.com. So uh, what if we use TensorFlow for deep models. It's good to start with on your laptop. You uh, created your prototype. You did some first tests, and it's nice. But what if you want to speed up your training? What if you want to run it on not on your laptop, but, but on a server or a bunch of them, meaning cluster? And what if you have many colleagues who want to do exactly the same? So the resources of cluster need to be somehow managed. And the thing that works the best for us for so far is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is open source uh, orchestration platform for containerized application applications. So basically what we do, we tell Kubernetes, please create a pod, which is set of containers for us. And we can uh, define uh, resources which we require for our job. It can be number of CPUs, it can be amount of memory you want. And starting from Kubernetes 1.3, uh, it also supports uh, scheduling workloads on GPU, uh, which gives us a lot of flexibility about uh, what hardware, we can, hardware and software we can use. Uh, uh, okay. Also, when we run a uh, training script, we export logs to a shared storage such as HDFS or NFS to visualize the training process later, because for some uh, architectures, it can take a while to train a model. And for instance, whoop, one second. For instance, we ran a hyperparameter search on for using three experiments. But you can tell about experiment A. It's a loss function for both training and evaluation validation set. Basically, it's not converging. So probably we should give up on this uh, 
uh, hyperparameter hi hyper configuration. What about B? Sorry? OK, uh, uh, yeah, it's OK. It's better than A. But it's stop, uh, loss stop decreasing, so probably we're not going to continue with that. What about C, the promising guy? Uh, we have both, actually, uh, training loss and validation loss. So they're kind of very similar. Uh, yeah, probably we trained. We can train for more, because loss, training loss and validation loss is still decreasing. So this uh, tiny hints you can get from visualization uh, training process are super fine. So also, uh, often we want to retrain models <coughs> daily, weekly, or by schedule. It seems to be a straightforward thing, but the, there is a, another step uh, appears. So after we train models on our laptop or controlled environment, we can evaluate the uh, model behavior. Uh, but if we retrain models automatically, what we can tell about model uh, properties of the model? How does the model behaves, behave as expected? So we probably want to collect some metrics and validate them against health checks. So we can uh, measure loss, AOC, or any characteristic of model we want, then uh, validate them against uh, predefined values. So it will help us to understand if a uh, model not going crazy. Uh, we also put a metadata file with uh, this model metrics together with the model, just to make sure in the future we can easily understand what, 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 what were the results for the model. And if everything is fine, we deploy the model. If not, we notify owners to take a look. Then to deploy a model, we use containerized serving. Basically, we build a very generic application that can serve mostly every TensorFlow model. Uh, it exposes HTTP API, HTTP API to query prediction. We <coughs> containerize this, the, the stateless application we developed, which allows us to easily scale uh, serving part as we go. Uh, also, we uh, rely on Kubernetes to make the serving resilient. So we know that we have enough computing power to serve uh, predictions. Uh, another challenge for uh, deploying model is good, but at the end we want to query predictions. So uh, what we want, we want, we want to know total time that it takes to get all the predictions we want. So this is a simple formula with, uh, uh, by request overhead here, I mean time it takes to encode features, to send them, uh, to decode the predictions if we use uh, any, any protocol there. And for simpler mo simple models like uh, logistic regression or deep and wide, request overhead can be much higher than actual computation time. So uh, if you want to use these predictions in production environment, uh, say on page view, we want to optimize for latency. Uh, the first thing I would do if I want to optimize for latency, try not to predict online and put this, uh, put these computations offline to create a lookup table and uh, fetch predictions from a lookup, lookup table, if it's possible. Then if uh, it's not, and we want really, if we need to, if we can't pre-compute and we want to get uh, predictions in a very low latency manner, we can actually embed the model to the address space of the application. So there would, would be close to nothing uh, uh, request overhead time. Uh, and also, if our computation time for our model is huge, we can just predict for one instance at a time. So we can have multiple uh, servings that predict just for one instance. But this can also be tricky, because if you, you want to parallelize this thing, uh, the 
total prediction time would be not less than the slowest predictor. Also, TensorFlow has uh, some nice tricks such as quantization. When you reduce uh, precision of your parameters to from flow 30 to, fi to fixed point integer 8, which gives you four times even more, actually, four times more computing power, and uh, it cons the model consumes four times less memory. Also, there are a few other tricks, such as removing unneeded nodes from the graph, and uh, so-called functionality, so function so-called optimized for inference, which removes unneeded nodes and uh, converts uh, variables to constants, which also gives a little bit of an improvement. Uh, then, if we want to predict for large number of instances, and we are not, uh, if we want to predict on large number instances, we can batch requests together. So, at a time, we predict on n examples, uh, which can increase latency. It's fine, but it's always a trade-off between uh, latency you want to have and amount of predictions you can get. Also, for throughput, it's very natural to optimize to send requests in parallel. And this is how our amazing platform looks like. Uh, we rely on Kubernetes as a uh, orchestration framework to serve uh, to run containers there with a simple HTTP service that sends uh, predictions back. Uh, this is this leaves behind load balancer, and for offline clients, we want to uh, sometimes put data right to Hadoop, and sometimes to MySQL. But for online client, we want to have a prediction. Say, for if we want to use the model on per page view, we want to get it very very quick, quickly. So, basically, the serving part exactly the same for both. <laughs> offline and online plans, and client has a power, has the power to choose which strategy to follow, optimize for latency or optimize for throughput. Yeah, this setup works fine so far. Thank you.